The religion must allow raw country girls to the best parties. This is a sad crush, Willoughby. Let us depart. Willoughby! Oh. Please. Who? No one. Do not think you can make a fool out of me. What are those? Nothing, just business. They're from her, aren't they? A little friend in Devon. You kept all this from me. I can explain. Yes, you will explain. much longer. I hate to see her so upset. Perhaps a stroll in the market today. Get some air. Marianne. My dear madam, I was much disturbed to find that there was anything in my conduct last night that did not meet your approbation. And though I'm at a loss to discover as to how I have offended you, I entreat your forgiveness. I will always reflect upon our former acquaintance in Devonshire with pleasure. You will know that it could never have meant more, for my affection have long been engaged elsewhere, and I am soon to be married. It is with great regret that I return the letters and the lock of hair which you so obligingly bestowed on me. I remain, dear madam, your most humble and obedient servant, John Willoughby. How is this possible? Oh, he's a rogue! A, a rogue! Well, he shall never be invited to dine here again, no matter how smart his relations. Marianne, at least you have escaped a connection for life with the most unprincipled man. Oh, I have never felt so wretched. Oh, happy Eleanor. You have no idea what I suffer. You call me happy, Marianne. If you knew, how can you believe me to be so when you are so wretched? But, but think, dearest, what you would have suffered had this discovery been further delayed, had your engagement carried on for months before he put an end to it. There was no engagement. What? So he is not so unworthy as you think. He has broken no faith with me. But he told you he loved you? Yes. No. Well, never absolutely. It was implied, but never declared. And yet you wrote to him, even though there was no formal understanding. Well, could that be wrong after all that had passed? Oh, Marianne. Oh, no, Eleanor, this is not. Marianne's fault. He is entirely in the wrong. Well, did he not drive her off in his carriage with him? Well, take a look of her The look of hair which you so obligingly bestowed on me. Well, that is unpardonable, for it is he who cut it and he who promises. Well, at least now Colonel Brandon can have her at last. Yet two thousand pounds a year, it's not much. But he does have some of the best mulberry trees in the country. I think I must see to Marianne. Uh, Colonel Brandon, ma'am, oh. Miss Bashman. Yeah, what did I tell you? <laughs> oh, good morning, Colonel. Uh, excuse me, um, I must speak to Perks about the ordering of coals. <laughs> good morning, Colonel. You look flustered. Are you quite well? I am, yes, sorry. I came to inquire for Miss Marianne's health. Alas, she is not at all well. Miss Dashwood, there is something. I've been with, wrestling with whether to relay some circumstances to you, but I feared they may cause heartache. Perhaps now they may at least allow some understanding of... You know something of Willoughby that might explain his actions? Once in our conversation, I alluded to a lady who reminded me of Marianne. The same warmth, spirit. 
Eliza was an orphan that my father took in, and from the earliest of age we were inseparable. But at the age of 17, she inherited a fortune, and against her wishes, was engaged to my brother. He neither loved her nor deserved her. He was intolerably cruel. Eliza and I made a plan to elope to Scotland, but her maid betrayed us. They were married and I posted to the East Indies. She was left without friend nor support. So she ran. She ran! I came back to England after my service was over. I tried to trace her beyond her first seducer, but eventually I found her in a workhouse, confined for debt and in the last stages of consumption. I tried everything I could to make her feel comfortable until, until the end. But, but out of that horror, a little girl was born, the offspring of her first guilty connection. She became a daughter to me. She lived with an aunt. I gave her everything I could. I tried to make her happy. And last February, she disappeared. She was gone for eight long months. And then what I feared the worst. Good heavens. She was with child. And the rascal that took advantage of her was... No. Willoughby. You remember the day of the Whitwell picnic when I was called away? She had finally been found. Her youth and innocence he had seduced away from her, and left her with no home, no help, no friends, and without the means to contact him. She was in the situation of utmost distress. I'm not proud of myself. But I called him out. Small of me, I know, but a moment's satisfaction. Thank you, Colonel, for this information which I am sure in time shall offer Marianne some small degree of comfort. Miss Gray, yes, yes, I knew her aunt long ago. 
If they're all rich together, you see. Uh, Miss Gray is wealthy. Mm. Oh, my dear, yes. Fifty thousand pounds. Did you not see her? Oh, not handsome. Not like our dear Marianne, but stylish and smart. I must do Mr. Willoughby this justice. He has broken no positive engagement with my sister. My dear, do not pretend to defend him. No positive engagement indeed. <clears throat> After he drove off with her alone and took her all over Allen and House, fixing on the very rooms they were to live in after they were wed. Nevertheless, ma'am, I must ask you not to speak of this with Marianne, oh, for it can only yes, further upset her. Yes, yes, I would not mention it to her for the world. Uh, neither will my daughter, <laughs> nor will any of our friends. You may trust me for that. In fact, I have been about it all this week. <laughs> now, let me just take that on stand here and put it somewhere safe. <laughs> Miss Lucy Steele. Oh, Miss Dashwood, my dear, dear friend. Good afternoon, Miss Steele. I come to share my happiness. Could anything be so flattering as the way Edward's family greeted me last week? Where? At the Grosvenor Ball. It was quite the talking point of the event. What was? I, oh, you think of your sister's outburst. It was, I assure you, nothing. Hardly spoken of after supper. But no, let me direct your thoughts to happier matters. For I was, despite my fears, quite the success with Edward's family. Mrs. John Dashwood was all smiles and conciliation. Your brother, too, so kind. In fact, it was funny. I, oh, forgive the familiarity, but we are such friends now, who invited me to leave the Palmers and stay with them at Portnum Square. But, oh, can you guess what befell three days since? Not in the least. I met Mrs. Ferrers, Edward's mother. Oh. And how was Mrs. Ferrers? Oh, she was all affability. And she seemed to distinguish me above all others, especially when we found we agreed about so much that is important. Undoubtedly, if she had known about your engagement to Ed, Mr. Ferrers, nothing could be more hopeful or favourable than this treatment of you. But as this was not the case... I guessed you would say so, but you shall not, you naughty creature, talk me out of my satisfaction. Oh, I have not met Mrs. Ferris, so Nor I... Nor have you. Of course, you have not the same relationship with the family that I have, so you will forgive me. Oh, you will rejoice with me now, for I am to stay with Fanny, uh, Mrs. Dashwood. I shall see Edward ever so oh. often. Mr. Edward Ferris? Miss Dashwood, I... Miss Steele. Mr. Ferris. Mr. Ferris. I trust you are well, Mr. Ferris. Pray, sit down. Thank you. Yes, sit. I shall sit. My mother and sister in Devon are still both very well. Good. Oh, yes, I should have. How are they? Well. And your mother and sister? Oh, definitely. Well, that is, they are indeed well. Mr. Ferris, I know Marianne will be delighted to see you, so... Oh, yes, of course. How is she? I hear not well. An old friend and brother such as you can only cheer her. I will fetch her and leave you as you both need. Well, um, we cannot disturb her. Uh... Did I hear right? Is Edward come to you at last? No. Well, yes. But then why have you left him? Lucy Steele is here. Oh, good heavens. Did she latch on to him at Fanny's? Why have you left them? Edward! Dear, dear Edward! At last to see you again! Miss Maria. This is a dear, dear happiness. This goes away to make some amends for everything. You are very, very kind. Do sit, please. Uh, how do you do, Miss Steele? Do take a seat. You must forgive a reunion of old and dear friends. Miss, no, of course, Marianne, I fear London does not agree with you. I have heard you were unwell. I do not like it at all. I expected to find much pleasure in it, but there was none. The sight of you, dear Edward, is the only comfort London has afforded. <laughs> you do me too much. Is it not a joy to see Edward again, Eleanor? 
A meeting of friends must always afford pleasure. Friends, say family rather, and as family, Edward, I think we must employ you to help us with our return to Barton. You're leaving? In a week or two, I hope. I trust you will not be unwilling to escort us on the stage. Mama will be very anxious to see you. Well, if I can be of service... Marianne, dearest, are you tired? Tired? No. I feel the need to do well by the world, even though I cannot. But, Edward, why have you not come before? You have been sadly missed. Hardly missed, I yeah, think. Yeah, but yes. Well, there were engagements I could not... Obligations. But what engagements are there when there are such friends to be met? Perhaps, Miss Marianne, you think all young men can never be trusted to stand upon their engagements. The weather, I think, has been particularly... Indeed. Very mild. You misunderstand me, Miss Steele. I know Edward has the most delicate conscience in the world and is scrupulous in fulfilling his duties and obligations, no matter how onerous they may be to him. Really? I... Marianne. Edward, are you never to hear yourself praise? Then you must be no friend of mine. For anybody that accepts my love and esteem must also accept my open commendation. You will excuse me, but I must return to my sister. So soon? But this cannot be, dear Edward. Miss Steele, I am sure, will carry a message to Fanny that you will dine with us. I could do so, but Mrs. Ferris would find that strange. You are too kind, Marianne. But go, I must. <laughs> then we shall walk to Harley Street together. Yes, of course. Good day, Miss Dashwood. Miss Marianne. Good day. Tiresome girl. What could bring her here so often? Could she not see we wanted her gone? And then I could have contrived to leave Edward with you. Lucy has been known to Edward far longer than we have. It is but natural that he should like to see her. Oh, what is it that you do not tell me? Why were you so cold towards Edward? You must know that your praise of Lucy Steele is just the kind of talk that I cannot bear. Marianne, please! Please do not speak of it. Of anything. You do not understand. It was told me. It was in a manner 
forced on me by the very person herself whose prior engagement ruined all my prospects. I was told, as I thought, would triumph. I've had her hopes and exhortation to listen to again and again and again. I've known myself to be divided from Edward forever. Without hearing a single circumstance, it could make me less desire the connection. If you could think me capable of ever feeling, Marianne, surely you may suppose that I have suffered now? Colonel, oh, I've been so barbarous to you. Colonel Brandon, ma'am. Excuse me, Colonel. Pray excuse Marianne, Colonel, she's... No, not at all. I understand, as I have heard, that Mr. Ferris and Miss Steele have been discovered to be engaged and <coughs> are now put out of favour and disinherited because of it. Yes, but I had no idea you were at all acquainted with them. Oh, I have no great knowledge of Miss Steele, but I've seen Mr. Ferris on two or three occasions. The cruelty, the impolitic cruelty of dividing or attempting to divide two young people long attached to each other is, is terrible. Mrs. Ferris does not know what she may be doing or what she may drive her son to. But I understand he intends to take orders. I wondered, would you be so good as to inform him that the living at Delver, now vacant, is his, should he deem it worthy of acceptance? It is a rectory, albeit a small one. Of course I will, but I wonder in return might you be willing to accompany us on our travels home. We mean to leave tomorrow and return via Cleveland. Of course. Thank you, Colonel. Then I shall attend you. Good day, Miss Dashwood. Hugs, could you send a boy to Harris Street for this? Hey, yes, ma'am. Mr. Edward Ferris? Mr. Ferris, thank you for responding so promptly. Not at all. To you, above all, some sort of explanation. Oh, no, must be... not that. I quite understand. You do? How can you? My engagement... A I... man's word, once given, cannot be lightly revoked. And I admire your constancy. And I admire courage. But my task today, on behalf of a friend, is a happy one. Do you know Colonel Brandon? I know he is a friend of your family. Colonel Brandon has desired me to offer you the living at his estate of Delaford. He understands you mean to take holy orders. I do. Colonel Brandon gives me a living. Can that be possible? The unkindness of your family has made you astonished to find kindness anywhere. No, but, but from you. Uh, after all that I've done, I'm not insensible that, that it is to your goodness. The Colonel I hear is <laughs> you to are you very... very much mistaken. Colonel Brandon is master of his own mind. This gift is his decision. Yes. Master of his own mind. A man should be that. I must, uh, I must thank the Colonel at once. Miss Dashwood, Eleanor. Goodbye, how... Mr. Ferris. And you have my very best wishes. Miss Dashwood. It is done. If only we could go home. The letter this morning confirmed the structural work I set in motion for the parsonage at Delaford is now complete. I think Mr. Ferris will find it more comfortable than he expected. You are too kind, Colonel. But I expect Mrs. Ferrers will wish to have a hand in the final furnishing. Ah, yes. Mrs. Ferrers. I believe I heard the word Delaford mentioned between them. It is as I said. It, he is telling her of his estates. Well, I am happy for them. They're well matched and the family deserves some joy. Oh, there's no obstacle that I can see. 
Oh, except, of course, Miss Williams. Miss Williams? Oh, the love child. I, I say, uh, Brandon, fancy a game of billiards before. Oh, thank you, Palmer, but no, I couldn't possibly... Too busy describing the delights of Delaford to Miss Dashwood, are we, Brandon? I confess I was wrong last year in the direction of your attention. I would hesitate to ever correct any of your statements, ma'am. Oh. In fact, Miss Dashwood and I were discussing the whereabouts of Miss Marianne, were we not? Yes. Yes, I am quite concerned. Well, will she not be roaming the shrubbery? She's taken such a partiality to it since we came. Outside? In this weather, surely not. If you will excuse me. But Marianne could not venture out in such a downpour. She could not. But my dear, she has been wandering in the park ever since we arrived here at Cleveland. Ever since you mentioned the Coombe Magna could be seen from the slopes above the far past. Willoughby's house? I had no idea it was so close. It isn't, except in the imagination of my wife. Oh, she has been so much calmer since you read the news to her of Mr. Willoughby's marriage last month. What shall I do? Marianne is still so very weak and her nerves much disordered ever since. And to exhaust herself, as she has done. She's truly trying to control herself more. You see, we had a conversation and she promised... What am I saying? I beg your pardon, I do not let a cruel battle on like this. Think nothing of it, my dear. The Colonel will find her. Charlotte, perhaps you'll instruct the housekeeper to have Miss Marianne's bed warmed, a, a, a hot bath prepared, a, a fresh set of clothes aired by the fire. Yes. A, a, and a fire built up in her room. Yes, at uh, once. Uh, oh, what a comfort you are, my dear. Uh, Miss Dashwood, I will send for my physician, Dr. Harris. I do not believe anything will be seriously amiss, but it is better to be prepared. Uh, he has seen Charlotte through some very bad turns. An excellent fellow. We put you to so much trouble, Mr. Palmer. Nonsense, my dear. Now, if you'll excuse me. She was oh. beyond the park. I found her lying on the ground. Oh, my goodness, is she? I do not know how long she's been there. This way. She lives, she's breathing, but... She's so very cold. Oh. Oh. Fever. I fear so. Miss Dashwood is so very warm and restless. What what more can I do? Remove your wife and child from the house. It may be contagious. Miss Dashwood, I cannot possibly leave you alone. You've already been too, too good to us, Mr. Palmer. Colonel Brandon, I think, will remain. Ah, yes. Brandon. Very good fellow. Uh, believe me, Miss Dashwood, if I could say, I would... Your place is with your family. I am only sorry we are driving you from your own home. Uh, nonsense. Our friends at Chaunton will have a say as long as we... As long as may be necessary. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. I must return to Marianne. Dr. Harris. We must, I think, bleed her again. The fever is too high. So sorry, Eleanor. darling, I am here. Over the gram. See Coop. See Willoughby. Oh, Willoughby, how could you? Doesn't love me anymore. Oh, Eleanor, Mama, Eleanor. Oh, hush, darling. I'm so sorry, Mama. Selfish, wretched creature. Eleanor bears all. Must be more sensible. Edward and Lucy Steele. Oh, Willoughby! Oh. What? Still raging. Her heart is a great strain, Miss Dashwood. What more can we do? Keep her warm when she shivers, and cool when she is feverish. But you must prepare that yourself, my dear. Uh, I must be about my rounds again today. Thank God the fever breaks soon. Dashwood, 
Colonel Brandon, I'm so sorry. No, no, it is I who intrude. Dr. Harris said that... There is hope. Marianne's fevers do tend to violent extremes. As does Marianne. Oh, in the name of God, Miss Dashwood, give me something useful to do. I, I think Marianne would rest should her mother be here. Of course. Simpleton that I am. I should have thought of this. I will ride at once and bring her in my carriage. Look for us. Tomorrow evening. It is nearly 30 miles, Colonel. Say round the day after. Colonel Brandon. Yes, dearest, he was here. Play for him. He listens. to call for you. She does seem quieter. Miss Dashwood, I have to... Oh, go no! No, 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 you misunderstand me. The pulse is as it should be. Last night was the crisis and you brought her safely through. Well done, my dear. I will go to Mr. Palmer and inform him. Is there anyone else in the house who can relieve you of your duties? When does the excellent Colonel Brandon hope to return? He said to look for him this evening, but I really do not expect him so soon. If Colonel Brandon says he will return, he will return, I think. Uh, try and have your sister take some of that broth. And, uh, well done. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, if you could be so kind as to send us your account. Oh, bless you, dear lady. But both Mr. Palmer and Colonel Brandon have told me to apply to them to the settle the account. <laughs> it's a good job I am honest, is it not? Good night, dear lady. Oh, Marianne, you are yourself again? I think so. Where are we? Cleveland. Carly, do you think you can take some broth? You've had nothing in over a week. I think I could. But, but do not leave me. I'm afraid of going again. Just a moment, darling, listen. I think that is Colonel Brandon. He's been so good, Marianne. Well, I think I know. He has been present. So often. But he went to fetch Mama. Uh, go to him. Leave the door open. I need to thank him. Bring him here, please. You will not overexert yourself. Please. I am sensible of what I owe him. Good God! Miss Dashwood, for half an hour, for ten minutes, I entreat you to let me stay. No, sir. You shall not stay. Your business cannot be with me. Your sister is out of danger. I heard it from the doctor. God be praised. But is it true? Is it really true? We hope she is. I've known as much as half an hour ago. But since I'm here, tell me honestly, do you think me most a knave or a fool? Sir! I mean if I can to make you hate me one degree less than you do now. It is hardly worthwhile, Mr. Willoughby, for you to relate or for me to listen any longer. I insist on you hearing the whole of it. You did then, at one time, believe yourself attached to Marianne. Yes. I found myself sincerely fond of her. And the happiest hours of my life were spent with her. So I determined to ask for her hand. But in the interim, a discovery took place. Mrs. Smith had somehow or other been informed of an affair. I have. I have heard all about Miss Williams. And how you will explain away any part of your guilt in that dreadful business, I confess, is beyond my comprehension. My aunt taxed me with the offence at once. The matter itself, I could not deny. By one measure, I might have saved myself. In the height of her morality, she offered to forgive the past if I would marry Eliza Williams. But that could not be. So, I was formally dismissed from her favour and her house. This was when I knew I could not have Marianne. To see her, I felt would be dreadful. And I doubted that I, I could do so and keep to my resolution. But I went, I saw her, and I saw her miserable, and, and left her miserable, and left hoping never to see her again. Miss Dashwood. Well, I left all that I loved and went to those to whom at best I was only indifferent. Well, sir, and is this all? Ah, oh, no. Have you not forgot what passed in town? That infamous letter. Did you show it? Yes. I saw every note that passed. Marianne's note awakened all my remorse. 
I felt that she was infinitely dearer to me than any other woman in the world, and I was using her infamously. But everything was just then settled between Miss Gray and I. To retreat was impossible. If you can pity me, Miss Dashwood, pity my situation as it was then, with my head and my heart full of your sister, I was forced to play the happy lover to another woman. And that night at the party, what an evening of agony it was. Marianne, as beautiful as an angel on one side, calling me Willoughby in such a tone. And then Sophia, as jealous as a devil on the other hand, looking and watching all it was. But your letter, Mr Willoughby, your own letter. Have you anything to say about that? Yes, yes, that in particular. Sophia saw one of her letters. A report had reached her of my attachment to a young lady in Devonshire. And, in short, what do you think of my wife's style of letter writing? Your wife? The letter was in your own handwriting. Yes, but I had only the credit of severely copying such sentences as I was ashamed to put my name to. But I'm talking like a fool. In honest words, Sophia's money was necessary to me, and in a situation like mine, anything was to be done to prevent a rupture. Oh, such was my reasoning as I parted with the last relics of Marianne. You are very wrong, Mr Willoughby. You ought not to speak in this way, either of Mrs Willoughby or my sister. But am I less guilty in your opinion than I was before? Yes, you have certainly removed something, a little. Well, but I hardly know. The misery you have inflicted. I hardly know what could have made it worse. Will you repeat to your sister what I've been telling you? Let me be a little lightened, too, in her opinion. I will tell her all that is necessary. Well, now you know all. Well, then I shall tender my goodbye. I shall go away to live in dread of one event. What do you mean? Your sister's marriage.
that hill is. <laughs> Marianne, may we pause a while? I am very glad to see you so well again, but not at the expense of my own wind and limbs. I think you are ascribing my own weakness to yourself. <laughs> but thank you, Eleanor. I would like to stop a while. Oh, there is the place. Right there on that projecting mound. Where I fell and first saw Willoughby. Oh. I am happy to see I can look upon the spot with so little pain. I am glad to hear it. Indeed, I've been meaning to tell you how much I've admired you these past months. Admired me? I think not. Yes, I've been very proud of you. You've been calm the entire carriage ride from Cleveland to Devon and attentive to Mrs. Jennings and Colonel Brandon. Well, how could I be otherwise? Their kindness merits so much more. Yes. But I have not always been sensible of what is owed to good people, being far too sensible of my own feelings and prejudices towards a bad one. Do not deny it, for I own it myself. Yet you did not allow your regrets about Willoughby to turn you against the cottage. I saw how every place, every object there reminded you of him. But you have taught me to apply reason to my senses. The pianoforte, which I loved before I ever saw Willoughby, so I will love it again without him. It requires only firmness of purpose. I have a program, you see. I'm going to apply myself to vigorous walking, early rising, industry about the house, plentiful practicing, and extensive reading of improving texts. <laughs> All in one day. Well, you mock me, but I will show you. And I will learn to forgive him. At present, I confess, I am comforted somewhat in the fact that he is suffering as I have done, and rightly so. Do you then compare your conduct with his? No. I compare it to what it ought to have been. I compare it to yours. I have indulged myself and my feelings with the unceasing kindness of Mrs. Jennings, Sir John, and the Palmers treated with ungrateful contempt. Dear Colonel Brandon, that good, good man, I mocked him with a much lesser one. And yet you found time to be kind to both them and me. Eleanor, are you weeping? No, not really. <laughs> to do so would invalidate your grand reform, would it not? Good afternoon, girls. What a walk pleasurable. Marianne, you did not overtire yourself. No, thank you, Mama. I am very well indeed. Thank you, Thomas. How was your trip to Exeter this morning? Did you manage to make the arrangements with the butcher? Yes, Ma, just as you said. And did you find time to call upon your sister? My mother. Yes, I did. Thank you, Miss Marianne. And much obliged was she for your kind gift of the shawl. I suppose you know, ma'am, that Mr. Ferris is married. Mr. Ferris married? What nonsense, Thomas. Are you sure? I see Mr. Ferris myself this morning in Exeter. And his lady, too. Miss Steele's was. They were stopping in at the New London Inn as I went past. I happened to look up, and so I see directly it was Miss Steele. So I took off my hat, and she knew me, and called to me, and inquired after you, ma'am, and the young ladies, especially Miss Marianne and bid me give her their best compliments and service. She made a point of saying how sorry they was that they had not had time to come and see you, but they were sure you'd understand. Will that be all, Mum? Oh, yes, thank you, Thomas. I shall ring when we want tea. Thank you, Mum. Lose my 
my sense of purpose if you... Yes, uh, of course. Eleanor, I did not realise. I was so concerned for Marianne's apparent affliction that I presumed that your engagement was less. Less. Oh, my dear, I was so wrong. Come, tell me all. Well, I think not, Mama. See, I am myself again. I have told Margaret a little of what passed. Enough at least to stop her from asking impertinent questions. I hope Eleanor I did right. Yes. Poor Meg. Kept sadly ignorant of all. Thank you, Marianne. That was well done. Where is Margaret now? I am expecting Colonel Brandon. I sent her to keep a lookout. Colonel Brandon? But he will have news of... of Edward and Lucy. They will have been on their way to the parsonage in Delaford. I wonder that he did not say anything yesterday. Or the day before. Surely he must have known about the... The wedding. Lucy might, but Edward would never arrive without warning. Especially as the Colonel has been so good to him. As he is to all. Edward, it is Edward! He is riding up the valley! Edward? Cannot be. He was in Exeter this morning and on the road to Telephone. Meg will be mistaken. It is sure to be Colonel Brandon. Edward is coming. But how? I thought you said he was married to that horrible steel woman. Never speak of anyone like that, Meg. It is not polite. It is Colonel Brandon, certain. Good heavens, it is Edward! Not one word, Margaret. No, not one word. We will behave as Eleanor would wish. Propriety and dignity. Mr. Edward Ferris, ma'am. Edward, you are very, very welcome. Please, come in, sit down. May I pass you a cup of tea? Thank you, ma'am. And we all do wish you very great joy. You do? Oh, good, yes. Thank you, Mum. The weather has been charmingly dry, has it not? That was fortunate for you, I think. Dry? Yes. Charmingly so. Indeed, yes. And is Mrs. Ferris at Delaford? At Delaford? No. M my mother is in town. I meant to inquire after you... after Mrs. Edward Ferris. Perhaps you mean my brother. You mean Mrs. Robert Ferris. Mrs. Mrs. Robert, Robert Ferris? Then you do not know. You may not have heard, but my brother is lately married to Miss Lucy Steele. I thought Miss Steele was engaged to you. Yes, well, after my mother made her objections known, I think my brother visited Miss Steele with the intention of persuading her to give me up. But, of course, he is now a man of a permanent and fixed fortune. Your fortune? Oh, no, ma'am. Never mind. My mother's to bestow or withhold as she saw fit. And since I displeased her, she bestowed it irrevocably upon Robert. Well, after but a few days, they, they found that they should suit, and Miss Steele kindly released me from our engagement, and they were married last week, and are now at Dawlish. Then you are not married? No, no, I'm not. Mama, Meg, Colonel Brandon is come. We must show him the garden at once. He has already seen the garden. Oh. Eleanor, are you quite well? Eleanor, I met Lucy when I was very young. Had I an active profession, I should never have felt such an idle, foolish inclination. My behaviour at Norland towards you was very wrong. But I convinced myself you felt only friendship for me, that it was my heart to learn that I was risking. I've come here with, with no expectations, only to profess, 
And now that I'm at liberty to do so, that my heart is, and always will be, yours. Indeed, you are not. 